So back in the early days of Grey Gaming when I was just starting to try out content other than settlement walkthroughs, I decided to release a couple videos detailing my picks for the best and worst settlement locations in Fallout 4. Well those videos had a bit of room for improvement, especially in terms of audio quality and gameplay footage and some folks have brought up some very good points in the comments suggesting my rankings may not have been completely fair. So it's caused me to do a bit of re-evaluating. After all, I'm only human. I've been known to make a mistake or two. Also, when we're just discussing the top 5 and bottom 5 out of 37 possible settlement locations, there's a lot of discussion that we miss out on. So that's why today I figured it would be good fun to offer my honest opinion on every single workshop location in Fallout 4. If that sounds like fun to you too, then make sure you have enough build material stockpiled and a hammer ready to swing because I'm Grey, you're watching Grey Gaming, and today we're ranking every settlement build site in Fallout 4. Of course, just like with our other rankings, we need to talk about the criteria we're using to rank these settlements. Being located in a good location is a very important factor, but we're also ranking these as locations that allow you to build settlements, not player homes. So by our criteria, a settlement location must be able to support multiple NPC families and be self-sustaining. It must allow for either dedicated structures to support living quarters, amenities, and industry slash agriculture, or allow for a structure large enough to be segmented into multiple multiple dedicated chambers for said purposes. We'll also be ranking based on the difficulty of terrain, the size of the buildable area in three dimensions, and unique handicaps a site may bring, like unscrappable structures for instance. As usual, we will not consider factors that can be improved with mods. As much as I enjoy being a member of the PC Master Race, we are trying to make this a conversation that console players and purists can find value in as well. Kind of a new addendum to that statement, we also won't be counting the various safe houses and settlement sites that were added in the Creation Club. For the sake of organization, we will split settlement locations into five tiers. Not a real settlement, worst of the worst, not so bad, now we're getting somewhere, and the cream of the crop. So let's go ahead and get the easy ones out of the way first. Using the criteria we just stated, there are three workshop locations that sort of get instantly disqualified from the running. These are each areas that prevent you from being able to build one or more of the basic types of objects necessary for our settlements to survive on their own. The Mechanist layer is quite problematic. Reaching it is fun and exciting, with enough lore and world building sprinkled in that you can forgive the fact that this is obvious DLC content rather than something that feels like it belongs in the base game. But once you unlock the workshop, the layer itself is an underground robot factory, so no pools of water to place water purifiers in and no dirt to plant crops in. Apparently there are some piles of junk on an upper platform that can allow you to place a water pump, but if you were the logical sort that made the mistake of scrapping all junk and debris before starting your build, that ability is now gone. Also, you aren't allowed to plant food or garden plots, so even if you did sneak a water pump in, the site still won't be able to support itself. Of course, the idea here is that this is the Mechanist layer, so you're supposed to use a robot workbench to construct a legion of automatrons, which don't require food, water, or other stuff that keeps us disgusting meat bags alive. But as a true settlement location, it's out of the running. Home plate is a player home, pure and simple. You aren't allowed to plant food, there's no dirt to place a water pump, you can't install a recruitment beacon, you can't build turrets, and you can't even send settlers or companions here either. So yeah, it's a place for you to sleep for free. You know, if you forget about that 2,000 caps that it takes to purchase it in the first place. It's just a place to lay your head in the safety of Diamond City, nothing more. The Boston Airport is very similar to the Mechanist Layer. There are some dirt patches that let you place a couple water pumps, and the terrain isn't nearly as restrictive as the Mechanist Layer, but it's still impossible to create a self-sustaining population here without crops, and without a recruitment beacon, you have to manually assign settlers to the location, though it can be done. As I know will inevitably be stated in the comments if I don't explicitly state this, the airport isn't really intended to be a settlement in the first place. It's really just here for BOS playthroughs if you intend to have Proctor Ingram, the most most underrated BOS member in all of Fallout 4 in my opinion, build the molecular relay, and also it builds the parts you need for Liberty Reprimed. So with those sad excuses for workshops out of the way, let's actually start focusing on the ones that feasibly allow you to build self-sustainable settlements, shall we?
Yes, Coastal College has fallen in the rankings to dead last. The crumbling house lies smack dab in the center of the settlement and can't be scrapped, the garage is too small to really make any practical use of and is missing a good chunk of the roof, and it can't be scrapped, a quarter of the settlement is a steep hill, another quarter is sheer stone cliffs, and the rest is littered with debris, shipping containers, and trees that can't be scrapped. It's the northernmost coastal settlement and really isn't near any place of importance to the main story. However, there are some redeeming qualities that are often over looked like um anyway just in case you thought the lone raider trapped on the upper floor of the house and the mire lurks that are living in what is assumed to be an old yaogwai den are the only dangerous you have to deal with there is a territorial death claw right around the corner who wiped out said yaogwai and a mire alert queen just down the hill both of which respawn also a scripted raider ambush on the road below the cottage and a nearby beach infested with mire lurks and ferals it's not plagiarism if you said it the first time so i feel safe in reiterating that if you just add it all together you have yourself a recipe for a big old bowl of Nope. At the complete opposite end of the Commonwealth, on the edge of the Glowing Sea, is Somerville Place, a settlement that's the complete opposite of Coastal Cottage. Just kidding, it's almost just as bad. In its defense, the terrain is much better than Coastal Cottage, so even though the only flat terrain is reserved for the corn patch and roofless house, the rest of the settlement is on a fairly gentle slope, so it's not impossible to work with. Just a bit of a pain. The build ceiling is fairly average, so you can build multi-story structures, but the big tree on the edge of the settlement clips branches through the floors, walls, and ceilings of any structure taller than, well, pretty much ground level. But that's about it for the challenges to building, so why is it so far down this list? Well, it's the spawn points for settlement attacks. There are two of them. One of them happens to be right on the default fast travel point for the settlement. So if you don't place that little floor mat somewhere that moves your fast travel point, you're going to jump right into a world of pain if you choose to respond to an attack. The other is right off the front porch of the house, dead center of the settlement. So you can't hide behind a wall, you can't build a tower fortress, you have to leave your settlement wide open and point all of your defenses facing inward, which is so counterintuitive. It was this serious handicap that actually dropped it from the bottom of this tier to almost tying with Coastal Cottage for the worst. Yep, it's still down here at the bottom, but calm down, stop typing, hear me out. I have done some thinking and it's definitely not the bottom of the barrel like it was with my earlier video. Y'all have brought up some good points. As I already admitted in the first video, its location is very good. It's on the very edge of the Boston ruins, so the raiders aren't as raidery, the mire lurks aren't so lurkery, and the super mutants aren't as supery. It's a stone's throw from Diamond City, smack dab middle of the map. Location, location, location. But then all the negative things start to come into play. The alley is narrow and cramped, half of it is even bugged and settler pathing won't allow them to even use the back half, there's rotting corpses everywhere from the previous raider inhabitants, there are two chained doors that can allow enemies to wander into the alley, which they will from the two open entrances anyway, the piles of rubble, ductwork, AC units, and other stuff hanging from the walls cause collision issues, forcing you to resort to things like rug glitches if you want to have any hope of using the majority of the alley's real estate. <gasps> The widest, most open point in the alley is occupied by an unscrappable stilted shack that can have pathing issues if you make the mistake of clearing the steps leading into it, and the build ceiling cuts you off before you can even get above about three to four stories, just in case you were hoping verticality could compensate for any of this. Yes, I will admit that if you only care about finding a place for you to sleep where you can upgrade your weapon, whip up a bowl of radstag stew, and head deeper into the Boston ruins, then Hangman's Alley is a great location, and it makes a lot of sense to allow players to have that port in the radio storm. But these things do not a settlement make. You're really starting to push the limits of what Hangman's Alley is capable of as soon as you invite a half dozen settlers. If Bethesda had fixed the settler pathing, allowing you to actually use the back half of the alley, correct some of the collision issues allowing you to make better use of the available space without resorting to glitches, gave a higher build ceiling, or even just allowed us to scrap that daggum shack hogging up most of the valuable real estate, this settlement would not rate nearly so low on this list. Heck, it probably wouldn't even even fall into this tier, but they didn't, so it does. Let your hate flow through you. Jamaica Plain isn't all bad. Its location on the southern edge of Boston makes it a great jumping off point for expeditions into Quincy and the southern coastal region of the map. There are three main structures in the middle of the build area, a small parking lot that gives you some flexibility, and though the building that houses the workshop is almost completely reduced to rubble, a bit of care with one of the less collision sensitive build sets like the barn or warehouse can allow you to almost completely restore both the ground and second floors of the structure to usability. However, the adjoining building is fairly 
small and cramped, so you have some options to repurpose it, but they're limited. And the third building is completely boarded up, which sucks because it's completely intact. The biggest issue is that I think most players were wanting the entire Jamaica Plain suburb to be unlocked and buildable, which if you have access to the main drag, the entire wide street between the town hall and the workshop, and the playground to work with, there's a lot of potential that is gained, but we weren't given any of those. Instead, we're stuck with a small driveway surrounded by a bus and pile of rubble, both of which create collision problems without doing much to block unwanted points of entry. At least all of the spawn points are located well outside of the buildable area, so defenses can be appropriately planned, and the build ceiling isn't as bad as Hangman's Alley, so you have options to build up when building out is no longer an option. Outpost Zamanja didn't even feature on my bottom five list last time, but admittedly, it probably should have. It's the northernmost settlement in the entire Commonwealth, and probably doesn't even need to be. Unlocking it can be a very dangerous prospect as this site is home to Boomer, a raider with a suit of power armor and a fat man launcher. So you have to be able to hit hard and fast before he has a chance to react and bring a mini mushroom cloud down upon you. Once you do unlock it, the area is not a complete dump, but it's not far from it. There isn't a lot of flat buildable area, though the sloping hillside east of the radio tower does offer a chance for a decent sized platform or tower to be built. The biggest problem people tend to have with this site, and I wholeheartedly agree, is an invincible set of wood stairs inside the buildable area that can't be scrapped. It can't be snapped to other platforms and can't even be targeted with console commands for those PC overlords that are okay with bending a few rules now and then. It's an eyesore, even more so than the shack that was added to the radio tower, which sadly also can't be removed. For the trouble you have to go to to unlock this place, and the increasingly more dangerous enemies you're bound to encounter as you venture further east or south of here, it's just not worth the effort it takes to unlock this place as a settlement. I really struggled with where to place Covenant. I think Bethesda's put a settlement like Covenant in every single Elder Scrolls and Fallout game, a place that looks safe and inviting on the outside, but is harboring a terrible secret underneath. If you choose to unlock Covenant under friendly conditions, which the vast majority of players don't because it's stupid, then you get a walled off pre-populated settlement surrounded by ballistic turrets. If you choose to unlock it by executing a bit of Wasteland Justice, then you get a settlement filled with permanent corpses, some of which are marked too heavy to move, so you can't even drag them away at a snail's pace, surrounded by the ever-smoking remains of turrets. Now sure, console commands can remove the smoking turret bases and the bodies, but that's not an option for console players or purists to enjoy the challenge of working within the bounds of the game's mechanics. The doors seem to enjoy locking themselves, so you have to continually unlock them, and since they are marked owned, I believe that if your settlers catch you breaking in, they will turn hostile. Feel free to correct me on that. So your only option is to remove the doors to the houses, destroying any privacy your settlers may have been able to enjoy. The stores that were manned by the pre-existing settlers can't be reassigned to new settlers, so you can't reuse the stores and you just end up with an entire walled-in settlement that has virtually no redeeming features whatsoever. It looks nice though. Croup Manor gets tons of hate in the comments, and I tend to agree. I don't think it's bottom five, but it definitely belongs in the worst of the worst tier. It's a giant manor on a cliff overlooking the ocean, but the buildable area ends just before the edge of the cliff, so you can't place a water purifier. You're stuck placing pumps. The manor has definitely seen better days, with large sections of walls, ceilings, and floors on every level wasted away and making it pretty much impossible to get any practical use out of it. The circular driveway is nice and level, but there's a big statue in raised flower bed in the middle that does more than a little to hinder your plans for a settlement. The buildable area is rather small, but it does have a decently tall ceiling, so you can build some pretty tall structures, which is usually how I end up dealing with Croup Manor. The feral ghouls that infest this place before you unlock it tend to stick around afterwards, so you know everyone loves to arrive at their new home to find corpses strewn about, and it's not exactly a picnic to reach Croup Manor in the first place. Add the fact that there are multiple nearby random encounter locations and vertebrate spawn points nearby by, and you can rest assured that when you just want to offload that junk in your inventory, your shopkeepers won't offer you the chance to trade because nearby explosions and gunshots have them roaming around looking for hostels. 
Ten Pines Bluff also gets a lot of hate in the comment section, and I'm not sure I completely agree, but I can certainly see where they're coming from. Although it has never really bothered me, I admit that the buildable area isn't as big as it could be. The crumbling house at one end of the settlement infested with rad roaches is a pain to work around, the unscrappable shack on the other end, and the rocky sloping hillside that you have to build on can make civil planning an unwanted hassle. I think it wouldn't have been nearly as bad if the shack was built on the old house foundation, sort of telling the story that the current residents tried to rebuild the farm and the shack is the best they could do given their lack of resources, but all things considered, yeah, it's not a great place to build a permanent settlement. Each of these settlements constitute the worst that the settlement building has to offer and can lead to a lot of players just choosing to abandon that aspect of gameplay entirely, but all hope isn't lost. There are plenty of settlements that are quite a bit better in terms of, well, pretty much everything. Let's start looking at some of the settlements that still ain't the pointiest sticks in the arsenal, but are a heck of a lot better than anything we've talked about thus far. So this was originally in my five worst settlements, and I have to agree that it was rather unfair toward Vault 88, but I still stand by the criticisms that were leveled against it, with some caveats. Vault 88 is a sprawling labyrinth of underground caves, train stations, tunnels, and basements. It's unlocked bit by bit as the sole survivor clears debris and fights to clear out new infestations of mole rats, rad scorpions, and even death claws. An interesting use of the workshop mechanic, and one I wish we got to see more of in Fallout 4. But once the gunshots cease to echo in the abyss and we settle in to build a better life below ground, Vault 88 loses its appeal almost as quickly as, well, the vast majority of other vaults. The cave system is massive, requiring a total of four workshops to gain access to the whole site, and the boring monotony of clearing all of the raw uranium, limestone, junk vault parts, and construction equipment to allow access to the whole thing, add the resources to your workshop, or just reduce the build limit to something manageable is more than a lot of players can bear. As many commenters on that video will a test, it's technically possible to create a vault that stretches from one end of the cave system to the other. But since settler pathing only allows them to use the main rail yard chamber, it's pretty pointless to spend the time painstakingly lining up your vault to do so. I stated that settlement attacks can take several minutes to deal with as the attackers have to travel down said long tunnels and passageways in order to reach the main chamber, but I also wasn't aware at the time that they can also glitch out and get stuck, forcing you to run the entire length of Vault 88 to the spawn points to deal with them yourself. Some people have pointed out that if you simply don't unlock the various alternative entry points, the attackers will only ever approach from the main vault door, but that's not a mechanic that is ever explained and runs completely counterintuitive to pretty much every basic fundamental rule of settlement building that we had learned up to that point. I don't want to get drawn into a bunch of drama that for some reason surrounds Vault 88 discussions, like people get super defensive or combative about it, so I'll just finish up. But if you want a slightly more expansive list of reasons why it's the very bottom of this tier, you can check out my Five War Settlements video, it's in there. I actually like Longfellow's Cabin, but as I started to weigh its pros versus its cons, it just kept slipping lower and lower on this list until it ended up here. It's not all bad, it's an island, but connected to the main map of Far Harbor by a tiny spit of land, so it's easily reached pretty much as soon as you arrive at the island. It has a very respectable build size and even has decent ceilings, so you can build wide and tall, but other than these benefits, it pretty much suffers from the two things that make Coastal Cottage and Somerville Place nightmares to build at. The island surrounding the cabin is home to some pretty tricky terrain, a deep drainage cutting through what should be prime real estate, long sloping hillsides, sheer rock cliffs. It really limits the storytelling that many settlement builders tend to try and weave into their settlements. Also, enemies spawn very close to the cabin, so much like Somerville, it can be tricky to position defenses in a manner that doesn't suspend belief, but also, you know, works. Green Top Nursery is a site I personally could do without, but admittedly it's not totally horrible. It's a pretty large buildable area even if the vast majority of that space is occupied by the shattered remains of a greenhouse. It has a pretty tall build ceiling allowing you to go taller go home, and the sanctuary style home at the south end of the settlement is, well it's about as useful as any of the houses in Sanctuary. It's sort of a settlement site that has a predefined story and purpose. It's not a good thing, it's not a bad thing, it's just not a great thing. The main reason I say I could do without it is literally right across the road is another location, Breakheart Banks, the remains of a farm built in, on, and around an old roadside rest stop before it was wiped out by super mutants. In my opinion, Breakheart Banks has much more potential in character, and as it is, Greentop Nursery sits a bit too close to the slog for me to consider it really that necessary. 
Bunker Hill is probably best summed up as wasted potential. It's a rotting, crumbling shantytown surrounding Breed's Hill, the actual site of the Battle of Bunker Hill. I know, it's confusing. The game gushes over the caravan trading hub of Bunker Hill, and I guess by Commonwealth standards it's pretty good, but when I learned after literal years of playing this game that you could actually build here, I was extremely excited to finally clean it up and turn it into a fortress, only to learn that not a single shack can be scrapped. Imagine being able to surround Bunker Hill with a concrete wall, a castle keep with turrets, heck, a perimeter made out of vault tech corridors, anything but 200 year old dried out lumber. My disappointment grew even deeper as I recently visited Bunker Hill in person and actually saw how close Bethesda came to accurately representing the area before they ruined it with this scrapper nonsense. Grey Garden is sort of all the bad things about Green Top Nursery with none of its benefits. It's a greenhouse that is missing so much glass that it can't possibly function as an actual greenhouse anymore on a steep hillside with no other structures that are of any use, even some unscrappable cars and trees for good measure. So why on earth did it rank higher than Green Top Nursery? One word, overpass. That's right, the build ceiling of Grey Garden is actually tall enough that you can build a platform up to the nearby raised highway and clear off the cars to build yourself a nice elevated sniper's hide and safe house. It would have been nice if the enemies spawned farther away than the front door of the greenhouse to allow some sort of civil planning on the ground, but it is an interesting mix of features that can be found at other settlement sites. As far as the northern coastal settlements go, Kingsport Lighthouse probably has the most character. It has a boat that still sort of floats, a wharf, of course the lighthouse, lightkeeper's house that's still most-ish of the way intact, the buildable area isn't tiny, and the ceiling is very tall. I'm not sure how tall, but I'm pretty sure I've pulled off 12-story tall structures in past playthroughs. The main drawbacks of Kingsport are the large number of unscrappable objects that get in your way, the lightkeeper's house, the big tree out front, the truck and trailer blocking the road, the crumbling wharf, some might even argue the lighthouse itself, but even though its landings are too small to realistically accomplish a whole lot with, I like the lighthouse and it's the only settlement site that gives you an intact lighthouse. I just wish that there was a nice strong light source that we could add to it to actually make it a functional lighthouse. The terrain is mostly flat, but is tiered between an upper flat that hosts the lighthouse and the lightkeeper's quarters and the lower beach, which contains the boat, the boardwalk, and the war pier. Okay, I'll cut it out. These sections are separated by cliffs, but at least Bethesda was nice enough to add stairs leading down so you don't have to build them yourself. Any open area you have is cramped, but a little bit of creativity can take you a long way at Kingsport Lighthouse. Murkwater construction site gets so much hate from the community, and I sorta of get it. It's the southernmost settlement in the entire game. The area is infested with everything from Mire Alert Kings to Sentry Bots, and the construction site itself is guarded by a Mire Alert Queen. So pack ammo and stim packs if you plan on setting down roots here. But beyond that, the site itself is less than appealing. It's a swamp, so you're surrounded by shallow strands of stagnant water, burned trees because you're right next to the glowing sea, the unfinished garage, and the completely collapsed house that can't be scrapped heck, even the forklift can't be done away with. So it's completely understandable why Murkwater is so despised, but it's not all bad. One nice thing about swamps is they tend to be pretty level, so you really don't have rough terrain to deal with. As long as you're okay with building on a platform, you know, place a solid level foundation and then build up, then Murkwater can actually be turned into a halfway passable settlement. You're not going to be building the next Diamond City or anything out here in the swamps, but a small village isn't an impossibility. And a fun note for those of you that have been with the channel since the beginning, it was Murkwater that first caused me to experiment with the idea of a tower build. Okay, I love Oberlin Station. I don't know, I'm just a sucker for settlements built on the train tracks. One thing I really love about Oberlin is that there's just a single structure you really have to worry about not being scrappable, and it's relatively tiny, giving you almost complete freedom to work with the grounds that you're given. The terrain admittedly isn't the best, with pretty much the entire settlement being a sloping hillside. There isn't much of a flat spot to build on, so you have to get creative, and the build area is small, one of the smallest in the entire game. It might even have Coastal Cottage be in that regard. But but attackers tend to spawn either on a fairly open hillside making them easy pickings or they spawn all the way down on the beach allowing you to attack from the railroad tracks from the safety of the high ground. It's over, Anakin. 
I have the high ground. And it's here where our list turns a corner and gets to stop focusing so much on the cons of settlements and gets to start focusing more on the pros column. 19 bad settlements down, 18 good settlements on their way. But before we move on, I would just like to ask that if you're enjoying the video so far, a like would really be appreciated as viewer engagement is a metric we use to determine the sort of content that provides the most value to you, a random person on the internet who has the power to determine whether I can afford to splurge on a pack of fancy lad snack cakes this week. Please, thank you, and now let's hop on over to the next tier. Kicking off the Now We're Getting Somewhere tier, the Tappington Boathouse is an excellent location. Positioned almost center of the north half of the map, it makes an excellent jumping off point for expeditions into Charleston or the northern coastline. It also makes a good provision or trade hub. The main limitation of the boathouse is its very small build area, most of which is occupied by, you might have guessed by now, a boathouse and a nice two-story house that's almost completely intact. The build ceiling is pretty decent though, nothing out of the ordinary. It does have a decent amount of buildable area over the water, allowing you to try your hand at a nautical themed settlement before you make it to the big leagues with sites like Kingsport Lighthouse, Spectacle Island, and Dalton Farm. Sunshine Tidings is a nice sprawling farming community that marks the last settlement west of the Charles River all the way until you reach Somerville Place. It's both fun and interesting that the main road leading into Sunshine Tidings is a dam begging the question as to how the heck you would drive a combine over that. The settlement site is surrounded by the rotting cabins that made up the various family domiciles of the pre-war residents. Some large silos, though I'm not sure what they were intended to hold as there appears to be a large pipeline that runs from beyond the edge of the map, so they probably aren't grain silos or milk tanks. I feel like I'm dipping into lore here, back on topic. The settlement itself is fairly level with a slight but noticeable slope running pretty much the entire length of the settlement. Some of the settlements are in good enough shape to repurpose and the warehouses are still actually in pretty darn good shape. The layout can make it a bit tricky to plan new dwellings, but it's not any worse than sanctuary and you do have quite a bit of open ground to work with, which is why I tend to film a fair number of my Commonwealth Contractor videos here. Or at least I did before I ruined it with a settlement builds for noob site. Moving on. A common favorite among commenters, the Red Rocket, has a lot going for it. There is just so much that makes this a great settlement location. It's got lots of dirt for farming, the Red Rocket is in perfect condition from its roof and walls that are free of holes to the rolling shop gate and sliding doors that are still functional. It just brings so much character to the settlement building. Every crafting station, minus some that were added in DLC later, can be found at the Red Rocket, making it an instant favorite for those that aren't all that into settlement building or plan to come back to it later on, so it makes for a good ready-made player home. And best of all, we get to meet the best friend any soul survivor could ask for in the entire commonwealth right here at the Red Rocket. With all that positive stuff said, there's still a lot of room for improvement. The hedges do add a bit of natural barrier in places, but it's also a bit of an eyesore that you have to incorporate into defenses if you plan to wall off the settlement. The majority of the flat terrain is paved, so it's difficult to find a spot for water pumps or crops, and what isn't paved isn't all that level. There's also piles of junk and debris that would have been nice to clean up, considering how intact the Red Rocket is, it would be nice to be able to go for a cleaner aesthetic builds if we wanted that option. You can still build decent sized settlements here, nothing massive or anything, but in all fairness, given the nearby Abernathy Farm and Sanctuary, the scenes in the opening credits, and the fact that there aren't any Minuteman quests to unlock the Red Rocket as a settlement, it's more than likely that this location was intended more as a player home rather than a full-fledged settlement site. Still, she ain't half bad. You ever hear about that farm run by ghouls? Isn't that something? I enjoy hearing that phrase about as often as I enjoy hearing about people taking an arrow to the knee. The Slog is an oddly gross sounding name for a settlement that is, in reality, really cool. Built in the remains of an outdoor swimming pool, the Slog is the only settlement location where tarberries can be raised in a safe, domesticated environment. The Slog actually has a fairly well diversified farm that you usually don't see in Fallout 4, with most farms just having a single staple crop, so good on the ghouls there. The build area is decent, the changing room are mostly intact minus some shattered windows and skylights and the entire settlement is very flat and has a decent amount of ground to build off of. The main problem is that the settlement does not lend itself to renovations. The beds are all rusty and falling apart and just kind of scattered about. It would have been nice to have the option to completely clear out the changing rooms if we wanted to go for a cleaner build or at the very least just line up the beds properly. Also the settlers here are all scheduled to spend some time tending the crops whether they're actually there or not. So if you choose to relocate 
replicate the garden or build over the top of it, the existing ghoul settlers will just sit there hoeing and pulling weeds on your nice new laminate flooring. Of course, these are only problems if you're not cheating with mods or console commands and are a bastard who doesn't mind wiping out a peaceful settlement of non-ferals. But who doesn't play that way? <coughs> So the best way to describe Finch Farm. Take a Grey Garden with its big farm and its intact section of raised highway, get rid of the no longer functional greenhouse, and change steep hillsides to gentle rolling hills. Pretty much nothing unique about it at all other than the manner in which it's unlocked, but it does just about everything better than the other settlements that it shares these features with. County Crossing is almost identical to Finch Farm, minus the overpass, so why does it rank higher? First and foremost, there is standing water at County Crossing, so you can place water purifiers instead of having to resort to water pumps. I don't know why it's a plus, but it's a plus. County Crossing is located just a stone's throw away from Charleston, giving you fairly easy access to the Constitution and Bunker Hill, not to mention that directly across the street lies the National Guard Training Depot, a site that contains two power armor chassis, so it's a great place to load up and prepare before you venture into the most dangerous sections of Boston proper. Echo Lake Lumber is such a unique take on the settlement building formula. We have shoreline, we have a dock, we have flatland, sloped land, flat rock face, we have bleachers, admin buildings, and sheds. There really isn't any place quite like Echo Lake. The problem is that the admin building can't be restored without serious rug and pillar glitching. The bleachers are piled high with garbage that sort of makes them pointless. The outbuildings are all boarded up, the dock is too small to do anything with, and there's really not all that much buildable area over the water to play around with a nautical theme. You know, that thing that was introduced with the Far Harbor DLC that takes place on a freaking island. These limitations aside, I still have loads of fun building here. I don't think I've ever built a settlement that supported fewer than 12 people comfortably, and even if you ignore the admin building and bleachers, there's still a lot of real estate to work with. To be honest, I never really took a serious look at the castle until about a year ago when I was needing another site for settlement builds for noobs and decided to try restoring the walls, and I think that's really the main intended purpose here. For what it is, it's a great location. The sections of walls that are still intact still offer plenty of cover. The central courtyard offers a decent amount of area to build around. It would have been better without the massive radio tower in the middle, but hey, it serves a valid lore and gameplay reason for being there, so I won't whine that it's unscrappable. It takes a ton of TLC, attention to detail and time to get it restored close to its former glory, but it is doable and pretty much necessary for anyone going through a serious Minuteman playthrough. Speaking of essential Minuteman settlements, Sanctuary tends to get a lot of hate, not so much because of its settlement building features and challenges, but because it's so closely tied to the Marcy Longs and the Preston Garveys. But strip away other settlements that need our help, and Sanctuary has loads of pre-existing foundation pads and open space for building, not to mention homes that are still standing, even if they realistically would be death traps. It's a meandering cul-de-sac, so it's a bit of a challenge for players who prefer to build on a grid. And the ceiling is a bit low for such a large settlement, but it makes for a perfect training wheel settlement, which is sort of the entire purpose of Sanctuary in the first place. There is a bit of an overblown amount of hate that people tend to heap on Sanctuary that it really doesn't deserve. You see, there's this thing called the Triangle of Death, where Sanctuary Hills, Red Rocket Truck Stop, and Abernathy Farm are so close to each other that the game engine will actually attempt to render all of the objects within all three settlements at once. Now this is dangerous enough in vanilla play on lower grade systems like Xbox 360s and such, but people People who resort to certain features to expand the build limit or just flat out cheat by using console commands or mods to expand these settlements to ridiculous levels can even bork your game on the latest and greatest systems. But that's not really the fault of Sanctuary, Red Rocket, or Abernathy. It's the fault of people who destabilize their games with mods. Wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. All I'm saying is, if you intentionally bypass components that are there for your benefit, you can't get angry if the system fails. So Warwick Homestead can be a bit of a crapshoot to unlock. I've gone back to Preston dozens of times to get yet another Radiant quest in hopes of unlocking only to go entire playthroughs without ever getting a quest to help Warwick. And sometimes players like to keep the game in Act 1 so they don't have to deal with crashing vertebrates all the time, but this also kinda locks you out from the guaranteed method of unlocking Warwick by doing chores for the Institute. Despite the complete pain in the gourds to actually unlock Warwick, it's a complete joy to build, despite how small the buildable area actually is. 
is. It's easy to defend since there's only one enemy spawn point, it has an okay build ceiling, and the big concrete building isn't especially spacious on the inside, but it's completely intact and the little outcroppings and balconies everywhere make for natural turret platforms. The dookie tanks can't be removed, which sort of sucks, but it's easily worked around. I could have done with a bit more buildable area over the water, but that's just personal taste. I like waterfront builds. And with that, I think we are ready to rat. ha, <laughs> not even close. Things are about to get interesting because if you've been paying attention, we've now covered not a real settlement, worst to the worst, not so bad, and now we're getting somewhere. So now that brings us to the cream of the crop. Let's get at it. Okay, it's no longer in my top 5, but Egret Tours Marina is still pretty dang good. It's a bit out of the way to be useful as a base camp for expeditions into the south of Boston or the Glowing Sea, but a pre-built dock over plenty of water, all but one of the buildings are accessible, largely intact for the most part, repairable without having to resort to glitches, it's very easily walled off and defended, decent build ceiling, very level territory, plenty of dirt for crops, I won't spend any more time on it, it's just good, check it out. Big settlements are nice, but if you're not one for the ease of building on flat terrain, then give the National Park Visitor Center a once over. It does have lots of flat ground, but it's split between multiple tiers. There's also gentle sloping terrain, concrete steps, the large gift shop and pass center. I generally gravitate towards large flat and unobstructed build areas, but I have to admit there's something magical about building large in a place like the Visitor Center. For a very long time, I think Nordagen Beach was my favorite settlement. The only unscrappable structure is a fully intact brick shed, minus some shattered windows, but we've seen a lot worse over the course of this video. The beach is an actual bona fide beach, lots of sand, sloped terrain, quite a bit of buildable area over the water. It makes for a perfect location for a waterfront resort, a boardwalk commerce center, and more. The build ceiling is quite tall, allowing for impressive towering structures, or since the build area is also wide, you can do a shanty town on the sand, directly across the water from the airport, across the bridge from Easy City Downs, across the peninsula from Libertalia, and on the road to Fort Strong, there's a lot of unique stuff to see nearby, and it makes an excellent outpost. If you're needing just that little cherry on top to actually take the time to check out Nordingen Beach, there is a suit of power armor just up the road that tends to spawn with X01 parts if you're high enough level. So what are you waiting for? Go check it out. It's difficult not to sing Abernathy Farms praises, okay that's a bit of a stretch, but its benefits far outweigh its faults. It's just a couple minutes away from Vault 111, so it's often one of the first settlements that players unlock, especially if they aren't playing on rails and trying to speedrun the main story. Abernathy Farms probably one of the most balanced settlements in the entire game, offering a fairly large build area and a ceiling that allows for 20 story high rises, you're going to be limited only by your imagination, and that whole triangle of death thing we mentioned earlier, but mostly it's your imagination. The settlement has lots of flat terrain, but it also has a somewhat steep sloping hillside as well, so it sort of serves as a training platform for new wasteland architects who have only experienced the winding streets and small foundation pads of Sanctuary, or the confines of the Concord Red Rocket. The giant shack built in the framework of an old power pylon can't be scrapped, so it does sort of force you to choose between a shantytown style build or having that big ol' eyesore towering over your settlement. Other than that, Abernathy Farm is awesome. Dalton Farm is a lot more troublesome to work with than Nordeg and Beach, with steep slopes and rocky outcroppings limiting your options to build over the land. However, Dalton Farm does have a long clear beach and the most buildable area over the water, proportional to total size of settlement of course. This allows for an oceanfront build unlike any possible at any other settlement location. It can be a bear to unlock as you have to clear out a famished fog crawler who ain't no pushover, but all things considered it's in a good location. I mean as good as a location all the way out on the island can be. So we had a lot of gushy mushy things to say about the Red Rocket truck stop, but the cramped and rough terrain that surrounds it makes it a pain that causes a large number of players to simply relegate it to the role of player home. Wouldn't it be nice if we had an intact Red Rocket but just plopped it down on an open field somewhere? Oh we do? 
perfect. In all fairness, the Nuka World Red Rocket isn't perfect, but it's probably as close as you're going to get. It does have some small puddles that are just large enough to plop a small water purifier, but if you think about it, purifying a mud puddle is about as stupid as trying to use an aerosol can of compressed air as a leaf blower, especially when a powered water pump provides the same amount of water and makes a lot more logical sense. The buildable area around the Red Rocket is huge and quite level, with just a slight slope on the eastern edge of the settlement. It has a tall, though not atmospheric, ceiling, but not every settlement needs a skyscraper. That's forgivable. The biggest letdown for me is the things that really made the Red Rocket and Concorde unique, the rolling shop gate and sliding doors, are missing in the Nuka World Red Rocket, but the Nuka World Red Rocket does have a wraparound painting that's super cool, as long as you don't accidentally scrap it as you're cleaning up. Oops. But the thing that really makes this site worthy of a top 5 spot is that it has a single enemy spawn point, making it very easy to plan defenses around. I'm a little disappointed that we only got one new settlement in the Nuka World DLC, but the one that we did get is awesome. Spectacle Island didn't even make my top 5 settlements video, and I admit that was a glaring oversight on my part. Sure, it's no picnic to reach especially if you don't have the aqua boy slash girl perk because you have to swim to it. Once you get there, there's a bit of a puzzle to unlock it as a settlement, and you have to chase off the mire lurks that seem to occupy the entire, rather large island. Once you do unlock it, you start to realize just how huge it is, mostly due to the pure tedium of clearing the dead forest away, but hey, you'll never want for wood again famous last words. The terrain is very difficult to work with, but you just have so much of it available that eventually you're bound to find a plot of land to suit your settlement building purposes. It also has a decently tall build ceiling, even if measured from the highest point on the island. It has more coastline than any other settlement, but the distance you can build away from the shore is actually fairly short compared to places like Dalton Farm and Nordhagen Beach, so if you're looking for docks and stuff, it's going to be pretty hard to find a spot for it. So despite all the praise that can be heaped on it, there is an equal amount of negatives that also come along with it, making it the single largest settlement in the entire game while also presenting one of the greatest challenges to build here. It's no wonder that so many players list Spectacle Island on their top 5 just because it suits so many different people's playstyles and needs. Sliding once again into our number one spot, Starlight Drive-In carries a lot of weight in that pros column with almost nothing in the way of cons. It has a large pool of water, one that actually might make sense to sink a water purifier in if we're being honest. It's a large, almost completely flat parking lot, so you know, easy to build on without having to resort to a cobbled together tiered mess. It's got a very large perimeter and very tall build ceiling, allowing for at least nine story tall structures in my sickeningly basic experience. The screen house, admin office, storage room, and concession stand slash projector house are all unscrappable, but since they're located on the fringes of the settlement, they really don't impede your creativity all that much, and they're for the most part intact, so you can reuse them if you want. It's located right next door to the Drumlin Diner south of Concord, so you have easy access to a predictably available junk dealer very early in game. It's right on the edge of the easiest section of the map, so there's not a whole lot to have to worry about beside low tier bugs and mire lurks and unlocked leveled raiders. It's also the reason that to unlock this place all you have to do is clear out a minor mole rat infestation, and if the Concord Red Rocket taught us anything, it's that mole rats are tasty, unless you eat them on a stick. It's located in a roughly central portion of the northern map, so it makes a great provisioner hub and a great jumping off point as you begin to tackle the late stages of the first act as you start venturing south in an attempt to reach Diamond City. Though there is a random encounter location underneath the train bridge which can cause frequent combat triggers, there appears to only be one spawn point during actual settlement attack events, making it a simple matter to plan defenses around. Easy to unlock, easy to build at, easy to plan around, and large enough to accommodate a significant settler population, it's no wonder that Starlight is the best settlement site in all of Fallout 4. But now it's your turn. Tell us your best and worst picks for settlement build locations in Fallout 4. We were a bit shorter with a lot of our synopsis... synopsi? Synopses? Summaries. A bit shorter with our summary, so there's bound to be things that we didn't mention about each one, so feel free to set me straight in the comments below. Until next time, it's been real, stay safe, and we hope to see you here next time on Grey Gaming.